Karen Evans. Today is Tuesday, July 26th. This is a special called Public Health and Safety Committee meeting. Uh, we are going to be talking about fentanyl poisoning and overdoses in Davidson County. I appreciate uh, my colleagues, Jennifer Gamble, Councilman Nash, Councilwoman Hauser for attending. Um, also, we do have a couple of folks that I want to recognize. We have our Deputy Mayor, Brenda Haywood, who is seated over here to my right uh, in support from the mayor's office. We also have the director of the Metro Health Department, Dr. Gil Wright, who is in the back. Thank you very much for attending. Um, we're going to be kicking things off today with a presentation from Madeline Myers from the Metro Health Department. Just to give you some context, back in March, we had uh, the first special called meeting about uh, fentanyl in Davidson County. And um, that is a meeting really worth going back and viewing if you have not seen it previously. Um, that was the same day in March that we also learned about the opioid settlement for Davidson County and how it would impact us uh, from a financial resource perspective. And some of the, the most compliments I received from that particular presentation were on one of our speakers that we'll hear from later today, Mary Lyndon Salter, who spoke on the science of addiction and, and how people become addicted um, to drugs. And so I encourage you to go back and take a look at that if you haven't seen it previously. Um, with that, we're gonna hear from Madeline Myers to get us started, who's going to share with us some information about current drug overdose trends in Davidson County. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Myers. Thank you. Hello, my name is Madeline Myers and I am the Middle Tennessee High Impact Area Overdose Response P Coordinator um, for Metro Public Health. I wanna express my gratitude for being here as well as everyone here in attendance. I'm presenting on the current drug overdose trends in Davidson County and I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Just a reminder for historical context, this was declared a public health emergency in 2017 and was renewed in January of 2022. Unfortunately, in this time, we have still seen an increase in overdoses and overdose deaths. Not only that, but we have seen a substance shift away from prescription opioids and heroin to synthetic opioids and stimulants such as fentanyl. We are currently in our fourth and deadliest wave of the drug overdose epidemic. It is categorized by the prominence of illicit synthetic opioids and stimulants. Currently, Tennessee is in the top five in the country for the rate of drug overdoses. If we look at these current trends of the overdose crisis, we are, and I reiterate, in the deadliest phase of the epidemic due to the illicit, due to illicit drugs of fentanyl contaminating the drug environment. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin or morphine. It is increasingly being detected in toxicology reports as it is often mixed with other drugs to create a more addictive substance. With that, Two thirds of toxicology reports show more than one substance present in a fatal overdose. Even after being declared a public health emergency, we are still continuing in an upward trend. This is a huge strain on our emergency departments, our criminal systems, criminal justice systems, and fire EMS and other critical touch, point, critical touch points. Finally, we are navigating new territory with the emergency in substances and fentanyl analogs. I interrupt you for just a second. Oh. Um, Ms. Hayes, it looks like her presentation is not projecting on the screen, even though I can see that she's advancing it from the laptop, and so we may need an IT intervention. Not me. <laughs> I'll just have to keep it there. I'll do that one real quick. 
just this one right here. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Sure, thank you. <laughs> So just to review, we are in wave four with the predominance of illicit synthetic opioids and stimulants. And there you can see Tennessee compared to the other states, the other red line is the median. Oh, there we go, it doesn't switch on my side. <laughs> A critical touch point is our local emergency medical services. While while local fire EMS activity peaked in 2020, we are still seeing trends that none, we are still seeing that none of these trends are changing. It is still remaining at high levels, though not as high as 2020. While there are slightly fewer deaths in quarter one and quarter two, there are more events needing naloxone, which is the life-saving medication. Seeing an increase in encounters that require naloxone and multiple naloxone doses indicates more potent substances in the local drug environment. This can be seen on the graph on the right that shows the average dosage among Nashville Fire, Fire Department and EMS response requiring naloxone administration. As you can see, it has increased over the years. The graph on the left shows the suspected drug overdoses requiring Fire Department and EMS response. Ooh, wait. That's what it is, sorry. The graph on the left shows the suspected drug overdoses requiring fire department and EMS response. The weekly average suspected overdoses requiring response is averaging 104 events per week in 2022. Another critical touch point is our local emergency departments. Looking at the data, the high number of incidences continue into the most recent data of 2022. This mirrors the trends that we saw with fire EMS data with the majority of visits pertaining to non-heroin opioid use. It is approximately 65% of 2022 visits. Again, we are on par with previous years. In regards to suspected drug overdose deaths, they have drastically increased in the county since 2019. The sharp increase coincides with the increased detection of fentanyl among drug overdose deaths. As a reminder, the, the record number of drug overdose deaths in 2020 was surpassed in 2021. At the moment, the first half of 2022 was down 4.5% as compared to the first half of 2021, with 205 deaths in quarter one and 147 in quarter two. This makes for a total of 352 suspected overdose deaths so far in 2022. For each of those 352 deaths, there was an average of 31.5 years of potent potential life lost. 64% of these were confirmed to be residences in Davidson County. Continuing the conversation from the beginning of this presentation, we are seeing a sharp increase in overdose deaths coinciding with the increased presence of fentanyl. In 2022, fentanyl was detected in 77.8% of deaths in Davidson County. Finally, to combat this, we have the overdose response program at Metro Public Health. Our role is to serve as the data and communication hub, leverage timely and accurate data to drive and support community interventions and support multi-sector collaborations. We have three grants and one workshop. I am on the high impact area grant, which spans over middle Tennessee. I also spearheaded the SAMHSA Gain Center sequential intercept mapping workshop, which focused on substance use disorder, critical touch points, and creating a continuum of linkage to care. We should hopefully have their recommendations by early July or early August. Our structure is shown on the right. A shameless plug, the positions in red are currently available. If you or someone you know is interested and would love to apply, we have those job positions going out hopefully next week. Please let me know if you would like to be part of the overdose response program. Thank you so much for my time here, and I am here if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or Katie Schlotman who put together this presentation. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Myers. Any uh, council members have any questions for Ms. Myers? All right, let me try to recognize you <laughs> if I do it correctly. All right. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you for being here today and for your presentation. I noticed in the slide where you talk about the uh, deaths of the fentanyl deaths per quarter from 2020 to currently, the second quarter for 2020 and 2021, that the deaths were really high, and it looks like they they aren't as high for the second quarter of 2022. Is there anything that you can attribute to that? So that would be a great question for Katie Schlotman, who's our epidemiologist. Um, I can just say on my part, um, we are still waiting to get final numbers from everything. So hopefully as we, you know, all of this is tentative data as we go forward, numbers should be finalized by the end of the year. Thank you. But any other questions from my councilman? Let's see, whose desk are you sitting at? <laughs> there we go. Uh, do we have any sense of why Tennessee ranks as high as it does? I mean, there's other states in the South that aren't there. Anybody founded on that? I would love to talk to you after this. I have a lot of ideas. Cliff notes? Cliff notes, I think that we need to be more aware of things that are going on in our state. Right now, our Good Samaritan law by law says that we only cover one, one, overdose, one overdose instance. But however, we have great community partners who are willing to go above and beyond this. Um, I think we need to work on the stigma that is associated with uh, substance use disorder, as well as continuing on our linkage to care. I think we do a really great job in prevention education, but those who are currently in the throes of addiction, I'm not sure as a state we are best prepared to help those individuals. Thank you, Sergeant. Any other questions? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Myers. We really appreciate your time today. As uh, Ms. Myers mentioned, Katie Schlotman is one of the key epidemiologists that's uh, tasked with putting together this data. And so any follow-up questions, I'm happy to make sure she can ask and, and share with the council body. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Sergeant Mike Hotz uh, from MNPD. And so if you wanna come on down. Um, one of the things I was remiss when I was doing my introductions and, and thanking people for coming is we do have parents here who have lost uh, children and family members um, to uh, fentanyl um, and, and substance um, overdoses and poisoning. And so I do wanna recognize they're sitting in the back and, and on behalf of the committee, I'm very grateful that you're here uh, to share your story. Um, in addition, I'd also like to thank Helen who is with the mayor's office. Uh, she's an intern and she has helped helped kind of keep things going with putting together um, everybody's presentations and organizing the session tonight. So thank you very much, Helen. And while we're getting the presentation situated, um, Sergeant Hotz is with MNPD. Um, I understand, I heard from uh, our Hermitage Precinct at one point, he was with the Hermitage Precinct, um, although I did not know him from his time there. Um, I've only known him as a result of his efforts um, with the Special Investigations Division and his team's investigative work on overdose deaths in our community and um, look forward to hearing his presentation today as somebody that is dealing with this issue actively um, in our community. It's moving around, but it's not opening up the, it's not opening it up like it's supposed to. I was just thinking, I really don't have a lot of good filler content. <laughs> You're supposed to do it over here. No, it's been acting up.
Rosie, are we able to pause with Metro Nashville Network while we take a little break and figure this out? Two, yeah. Okay, so Metro Nashville Network, we're, we're gonna take a um, probably five or so minute hiatus. And so we'll reconvene here in just a minute while we get our tech issues uh, figured out and then we'll come back on. Again. Uh -huh. I'll just read off of that. Okay. Okay. All right, are we good? Or do you need more time? I think I'm good. Okay. All right, very good. All right, we're back in business. Okay, Metro Nashville Network, I'll count down. Uh, five, four. For those of you rejoining us, um, we are reconvening uh, with Sergeant Mike Hotz for our special called Public Health and Safety Committee meeting. And so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Sergeant Hotz to hear about uh, MNPD and the Special Investigations Division and his work with that team. Good afternoon, my name is Mike Hotz. I'm a sergeant with the Metro Nashville Police Department. I'm assigned to the Specialized Investigations Division Neighborhood Safety Unit that primarily investigates drug overdose deaths. I'd like to thank Council Member Evans for calling this special meeting uh, to bring attention to the important uh, issue. Uh, just as an introduction to fentanyl and a little bit of background information, fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. It's typically used to treat patients with chronic severe pain or severe pain following surgery. Um, and when it's prescribed under the supervision of a licensed medical professional, it has a legitimate medical use. It is currently a Schedule II controlled substance. Um, it, illegal fentanyl that is primarily manufactured in foreign clandestine labs and then smuggled into the United States through Mexico is being distributed across the country um, and sold on the illegal drug market. Uh, fentanyl is being mixed in with other illegal substances uh, to increase the potency of the drug. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing it being pressed into pills made to look like legitimate prescription opioid pain medication and or other prescribed medication. This is what I'll refer to as counterfeit prescription pills. Uh, because there's no official oversight or quality control during the manufacture of these counterfeit prescription pills, um, they often contain lethal doses of fentanyl with none of the promised drug uh, that was advertised to the potential person that purchased it. There's also an alarming increase of overdoses in individuals who thought they purchased cocaine but were actually sold fentanyl there's a significant risk that illegal drugs have been intentionally contaminated with fentanyl. Because of its potency and the low cost, drug dealers have been mixing fentanyl with other drugs, including heroin, methamphetamine, and cocaine, increasing the likelihood of a fatal interaction. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is up to 50 times stronger than heroin, which is an already extremely potent drug, and it is 100 times stronger than morphine. A common street term for a measurement of a drug is called a point. Uh, a point of heroin is a common dosage unit for an average person who's using, um, and it is equal to a 0.1 grams, which hence the term a point. Two milligrams, milligrams of fentanyl is considered a lethal dose to the average sized adult. So if we do our math on this, two milligrams is 0 0.002 grams. One gram of fentanyl contains roughly 500 fatal doses of fentanyl. And to make that, to put it into perspective, a sugar packet contains approximately one gram of sugar. So by that math, one sugar packet that would be filled with fentanyl contains enough fentanyl to kill 500 average adult-sized humans. 
Counterfeit pills posing as oxycodone and Xanax are a large emerging trend in the United States. Here are some photos of pills seized in Nashville. This is commonly referred to as a blue M30 pill. It is stamped on one side with the letter M and the other side with the number 30, posing as an oxycodone pill. This is an example of a counterfeit prescription Xanax bar. It's stamped on one side B707, and on the other side it does not have a stamp. It's a rectangular shaped quadruple segmented pill. Um, for those that don't know, Xanax is commonly prescribed as an anti-anxiety medication, and why fentanyl would be found in an anti-anxiety medication is beyond me, and an extremely dangerous trend. This is the reverse side of that counterfeit prescription Xanax bar. One of the most frightening facts about the counterfeit prescription pills, uh, the trend that we're seeing, is that younger individuals, teenagers and people in their early 20s have, and there are Department of Justice studies that back this up, they have an impression or a belief that a prescription pill is inherently safe, whether for recreational use or otherwise because they believe it comes from a doctor and a doctor wouldn't prescribe something that is dangerous or possibly even fatal. However, when you couple that belief among our youth in our city of Nashville with the fact that counterfeit prescription pills are being loaded with fent uh, fatal doses of fentanyl is a particularly disturbing uh, emerging trend. Fentanyl is a fine powder and it needs to be mixed in a controlled pharmaceutical laboratory. Um, it needs to be measured with the most sophisticated and calibrated equipment available to our pharmaceutical corporations and the illicit fentanyl that is on our streets now is not being mixed in that manner. When it's mixed by drug dealers, the distribution of fentanyl is uneven, dangerous, and frequently deadly. This is an alarming statistic. The DEA has found that 42% of pills tested for fentanyl contained at least two milligrams of fentanyl, which as I described in an earlier slide, is a fatal amount of fentanyl for the average sized adult. So that means of the counterfeit prescription pills that we have seized across the country containing fentanyl, 42% of them are fatal doses. It's possible for someone to take a pill without knowing it contains fentanyl. It is also possible to take a pill knowing it contains fentanyl, but with no way of knowing how much fentanyl is in there or whether or not it contains a lethal dose. Fentanyl pills. I wanted to illustrate the mixing issue when it comes to fentanyl pills. Uh, take for an example the analogy of a chocolate chip cookie. The chocolate chips in this case will represent fentanyl. The cookie dough is the inner binder material that's present in every pill that's manufactured. No matter how well you mix the cookie dough, when the cookies are baked, every cookie is gonna have a different amount of chocolate chips in it. One cookie could have just a few, while another cookie could be loaded with them, meaning a fatal dose of fentanyl. These counterfeit prescription pills are not being mixed in a controlled pharmaceutical laboratory environment. They are being mixed by drug trafficking organizations and drug dealers with little to no concern for the amount of fentanyl that is present within the drug itself. This is an illustration of a lethal dose of fentanyl provided by the Drug Enforcement Administration. This is another representation. Now 
in reference to Davidson County overdose deaths. Drug-related overdose deaths are increasing at an alarming rate, largely because of fentanyl. More public, public, more public awareness is needed to shed light on this plague ravaging our city. But it isn't just contained to the city of Nashville itself. It extends to the state of Tennessee and it extend, extends to the entire nation. Um, I just found out recently my roommate in college last month, uh, he had moved to Hawaii with his girlfriend, uh, not a recreational drug user. Um, he was found deceased from a fentanyl overdose. This is gonna touch everybody's life if it hasn't touched it already. These are the numbers of Davidson County overdose deaths for the different years. This is information is provided by our partners at the health department. In 2017, there were 336, 346 in 2018, in 2019, 468, 2020, 621, and in 2021, 725. I do a lot of public speaking engagements and educational events, and a common theme when I present the data that 725 Davidson County drug overdose deaths in 2021, people there often try to correct me and say, well, no, that's actually the state of Tennessee. 725 people in Davidson County, Nashville, our city, died of drug overdose deaths in 2021, led predominantly by fentanyl. 2022 is also on track to be even deadlier in certain categories. In December of 2020, Metro Nashville Police Department Chief Dr John Drake ordered the creation of the Neighborhood Safety Unit to investigate drug overdose deaths. I was tasked with building a team whose mission was to hold those accountable who kill people with deadly drugs. The Neighborhood Safety Unit investigates drug overdose deaths and attempts to identify the drug dealer who sold the victim the fatal dose. In Tennessee, under Tennessee state law, if you provide somebody with drugs, either a Schedule I or a Schedule II drug, that proves to be the proximate cause of their death, you can be charged with second degree murder. And that's one of the main goals of the Neighborhood Safety Unit. A secondary and equally, equally important mission of the Neighborhood Safety Unit is community outreach within the substance use disorder community. We aim to provide education on the overdose epidemic and put people in touch with treatment resources. If we help in getting one person into treatment for substance use disorder, that's one less overdose death that we will need to investigate. I've learned a lot during my time in the drug overdose unit and I have a lot more to learn, but the most significant thing is the emotional trauma that families suffer after losing a loved one to an overdose. On that note, if you take the statistic that I referenced earlier, 725 drug overdose deaths in Davidson County in 2021, and you multiply that by the tree of family members that comes from each of those overdose death victims. The number of people touched by this epidemic is growing by the hour, by the day, and by the year. We partner with a lot of different agencies who all share a common mission to fight the drug overdose epidemic in any way we can. Uh, and I wanna take a minute to thank all of our partners here today. I mentioned Council Member Evans, as well as all the other council members here, all the families of people who have lost someone to a drug overdose death, to our partners at the Ropes and Stars who provide treatment, or who provide um, naloxone, which is a life-saving drug that can reverse the effects of an overdose. Our partners at the health department who give us the numbers we need. Uh, it's an all hands on deck approach and uh, I very much appreciate everybody. One of our partners who couldn't be here today is the community overdose response team. 
they're a grant funded organization specializing in helping people get in touch with treatment for substance use disorder. The important thing I wanted to focus on here is that they are able to put people in touch with treatment even if that person does not have health insurance or money to pay for the treatment itself. So if you or somebody you know suffers from substance use disorder, please call the Community Overdose Response Team at 615-687-1701. And I encourage everybody to copy down this phone number. As far as the MNPD response to the overdose epidemic and the fentanyl epidemic, there's been an alarming increase in the downtown corridor of drug dealers selling what they present as cocaine, but is actually fentanyl. More efforts are needed uh, to educate our the visitors to our great city never to purchase or use drugs from somebody they don't know. I mentioned earlier, there is no safe recreational drug use nowadays. The times have changed. I would also encourage people to obtain Narcan or Naloxone. That's the drug that can reverse the effects of an opioid overdose. It's the closest thing I've ever seen to a magic drug, and it has saved people's, countless people's lives. I encourage business owners to have Narcan on hand and ready to use, particularly our partners in the downtown corridor that have a high population of people in and out of the doors. I would encourage parents, you need to speak with your children and have honest discussions about fentanyl, and in particular, the trend of counterfeit prescription pills containing fentanyl. The kids need to know that there is no safe recreational drug use anymore. We need to change the way that our society views those who suffer from substance use disorder. These deadly drugs change the way a person's brain operates, and it physically changes the brain's ability to make rational decisions. We need to treat substance use disorder like the disease it is. We need to increase our society's access to treatment resources and education for our citizens so that they're armed with the knowledge they need going forward. I thank you all for your time and attention, and I appreciate everybody's uh, focus on this most important issue. Thank you, Sergeant Hodds. I, I had a couple of questions uh, based on some of the things you said in relation to uh, what Ms. Myers was discussing uh, around some of the trend information that we, we've got the first half of the year, this year we've gone down four and a half percent with deaths, but then there was also kind of the mention of, you know, um, that the potency, kind of the overdoses have been, um, you know, we've used Narcan on more people and saved more people, but that the potency is also higher. And so I know you've, you and I have spoken off line about this as well, about what you're seeing with regard to having to use um, the additional doses of Narcan to revive people um, and also other, uh, I believe there's another kind of Narcan where, which, where it's more concentrated and I can't remember the name of it, um, that has more than one dose potentially, I guess, in, a, in an inhaler. Can you speak to any of that? Yes, uh, I can say at the beginning when fentanyl was first on the scene, um, a single or maybe a, a two dose of Narcan would in most circumstances be enough to bring somebody back and reverse the effects of an overdose. Um, the fentanyl, the potency of the fentanyl as well as the amount that's being ingested um, has increased so significantly that it does not shock me when I hear, and I do frequently hear, that it would take seven or eight doses of Narcan, which is a two milligram dosage, I believe. Um, and the problem, so much Narcan was having to be used, especially in the intranasal Narcan that is issued to every Metro Nashville police officer. Um, the two doses that we are all issued, the four milligrams, was found to not be enough in a lot of circumstances to save somebody's life. And the pharmaceutical corporations actually had to back up and make a dose of Narcan that is twice as strong. Um, and the amount of illicit fentanyl that is on our streets, I cannot 
overestimate this. The amount that is on the streets of our city is shocking and frightening. We've had some really high profile um, Bus, I guess, and I apologize, I don't know all the MNPD terminology, so you'll have to correct me, but uh, you know, that have been shared on the MNPD um, like Twitter page and social media pages of you know, how, how much, how many drugs have been, you know, um, secured downtown um, by police. Is, you know, anything that you wanna speak to related to what you're seeing as far as, you know, when you're, you're actually um, catching folks that are, are selling uh, drugs in, in downtown areas? Um. I can't go into all the details, but what I can say is that our clandestine efforts will continue into the foreseeable future. Um, individuals who wish to sell uh, drugs posed as one drug, but actually containing another drug on the streets of our city, whether it's in the downtown corridor or elsewhere, we are actively investigating every lead that we get, and we will hold those accountable who are selling these fatal drugs on our streets and killing our citizens. Um, thank you, I'm happy to recognize any of my council peers who may have questions. All right, doesn't look like, oh, wait, C Councilwoman Hauser, you do? Hang on just a second, let me find you. All right, Councilwoman Hauser. Oh, sorry, hang on one second, I, I hit the wrong button. Let me grab the right button here. All right, now, now go for it. First off, I am going to invite you and anyone else on the team to come out to Bellevue. I wanna have a huge community meeting and I need your help in not only getting the word out to the adults, but also the teenagers in the area and what we can do and what we can do to recognize these issues. I think a lot of us, uh, something may be right in front of our face and we wouldn't know it. Uh, and so I think we all need the training on how to recognize the variety of issues, not only someone that's in distress uh, and what needs to be done, but the fact that someone may be vulnerable to, to this. And I, very seriously, I, I'm ready to do this workshop, whatever it takes and make it happen. And I, I hope you respond to that and, and, and the others as well. Uh, what can you tell parents on what to get, what words to get off, off to the kids? Just saying no obviously does not work. So, so are you guys going into the high schools? What, what is the outreach to the community now? I personally um, taught a class to all of our school resource officers that are in all the schools across the county um, to not only talk about fentanyl and the different forms that it can be found in, but we also had our partners from Ropes and Stars there to provide additional training on recognizing the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose or a drug overdose uh, before it reached the fatal stage. There's a critical set of minutes between when somebody is beginning phase of suffering a fatal overdose but before they die. So as far as what are we doing in the community, um, we have community outreach events where we provide education as well as bringing our partners with us to provide Narcan and Narcan training as well as having treatment options for anybody. We actually had one uh, community outreach event several months ago where an individual was ready for treatment right then and there as we were uh, with them and with our partners, we were able to put them in a Uber and send them, uh, our partners found them a bed at a local treatment facility and they went immediately that day, that hour to get treatment. Um, now as far as uh, how parents need to speak with their children. Uh, I'm a father of three. I, every child is different, every parent is different. The thing that I've found that is the most effective with almost any child is just to be honest. Kids are gonna know if you're dancing around a topic or not being entirely truthful about a specific topic. Um, I would be extremely truthful with what you said and just make sure that it is ingrained in their memory that there are no safe drugs nowadays. You know, in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, early 2010s, that was a different ball game. 
Um, one alarming statistic that I can point out to, and my health department partners can do statistics a whole lot better than I can, but the largest drug that was responsible for most drug overdose deaths in the past was heroin. Now, obviously, as um, hopefully we're describing, it has migrated into fentanyl. By far, fentanyl is the most deadly drug. Um, the numbers of drug overdose deaths in Davidson County are not yet finished. Um, obviously, the year isn't finished, but the fact that the deaths by heroin are currently sitting at zero and the fentanyl deaths are the leading cause is an alarming trend. Thank you very much, uh, Councilwoman Gamble. Thank you, Investigator or Sergeant Holtz, and and I just have a comment. And the, the, I guess the important thing to remember is, while the fentanyl is the most uh, causing the most deaths, it seems like many people don't know that they're taking fentanyl. That's the scary part about it. They think they're taking another drug, and it's laced with fentanyl. So just the importance of of letting people know that, as you said, there are no safe on the street illicit drugs anymore. They, in most cases, are contaminated with this synthetic drug that, that's killing many of our many of our people. So thank you for coming today and bringing light to this issue. Thank, thank you, you Chair, much, for having this meeting. Thank you, Councilman Gamble. Any other questions? All right. Councilman Hot, or uh, Sergeant Hotz, I'm gonna adopt you into the council here. Uh, thank you very much for coming today and speaking to this issue from your perspective. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Councilman. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, next, we are going to hear um, from our parents. Um, we have two invited uh, parents who have lost children uh, today. Um, and the first one that we're going to hear from is Tanya Jacobs. Um, Tanya Jacobs lost her son, Romello. And so she is going to come up and share some information with us about her experience. And thank you very much for being here. Good afternoon, my name is Tanya Jacobs and I'm the mother of Romelo Marchman. <clears throat> um, I wanted to say thank you for letting us uh, do this presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, I think it's really important that we bring awareness to this as much as possible. And I also wanna recognize uh, the moms in the audience. I had asked moms and uh, families and loved ones that have lost somebody to fentanyl poisoning to come and bring a picture of their loved one or of their child. Um, and some of my family members are also present to show their support. So I appreciate everybody um, coming for us today. Um, so my uh, son, Romello, he, I guess we're going through the same thing. I'm just gonna read off of that one. Um, he was born here in Nashville in, on October 1997. He graduated from high school in 2015. Um, from 2015 to 2019, he worked various jobs. Um, just like so many other kids, they take a while these days to figure out what they wanna do. Um, but by May 2019, um, he told me that, Mom, I think I know what I want to do. And he decided he wanted to become an uh, electrical apprentice. So I helped him get his first job with an electrical contractor in Nashville. Um, it only lasted about six months because they had to lay him off. They didn't have enough work. But while he was going to work, he also attended the ABC Contractors Apprenticeship Program here in Nashville twice a week, where they have more hands-on learning, you know, apprenticeships like they used to do a long time ago. And so he stuck with that. Um, the lady at the school told him that the principal to not stop coming to school, keep coming to school, we'll help you find another contractor. And in February of 2020, he ended up finding another contractor and he kept right on going, started working with them and kept going to school. And actually the week before 
he died. He took his first year exam and he passed it. So I found that out from his teacher that came to the funeral, because I've never met the young man. Um, so uh, he was excited about his new job, but in March is when the pandemic started. He had his own apartment. You know, he had his friends, couldn't see the friends, played video games, went to work. But he was stressed and worried like everybody else. And so he, um, on Memorial Day weekend, um, he was apparently feeling down. Of course, I'm, I'm actually, I live in Colorado, so I didn't know what was going on. We wouldn't talk every day. Um, and he had some friends that he hung around with and they gave him what he thought was cocaine. So he thought probably to feel a little better, but what he didn't know was that, and I just found this out later, that the little baggie that they had given him was, there was no cocaine in there. It was 99% fentanyl. So once he took that and he was by himself, there was nobody with him in his apartment. He died within a few minutes um, by himself in his apartment. And I do not consider Romello being a drug, drug addict. He was a recreational user like so many young kids, but he was not an addict. Um, so it took me about six months to I don't wanna say get out of my grief because that's something that take longer, but to kind of function again and for my brain to work. Um, and I feel that he wanted me to find my mission in life and for me to start a foundation or a nonprofit to try to help other families um, that have lost children to fentanyl poisoning and to help educate parents that haven't lost a child yet to make sure they don't lose one so they know what is going on in this country. Um, and of course, also Tennessee. Um, so I decided to honor him by starting this nonprofit. And we started a website, we started a Facebook page. And our mission is to bring awareness to the illicit fentanyl epidemic in Nashville and Tennessee through in-person events, billboards, reaching out to schools, colleges, universities, PTAs, government in general, pediatricians, and so forth. I'm trying to think of big organizations that are national to get together with them so they can help me spread the word on a national level. One of them for an example, and I am just have to tell you because it still shocks me, I reached out to the National PTA Association because I thought this way I don't have to try to get in touch with every PTA in Tennessee. They turned us down. They will not help us. So I am still haven't figured out yet how I'm going to fight this, but I'm not done with them yet. It's That's just shameful. I just cannot believe that they would not want to help with this. Um, so some of the things um, that I'm, or some of the ways that I'm trying to bring awareness, I've been sort of um, successful with to some point and others I have not. So we have a, a few very important points. Um, the illicit fentanyl deaths are not overdoses. They are murders because our children and loved ones were poisoned. Had they received what they had asked for or thought they were getting from a friend or from Snapchat, from a drug dealer, they would all still be here. It's because it was laced with a poison like the Tylenol poisoning you had in the 80s. To me, that's exactly the same thing. Um, so, it's because it was laced or pretended to be something that it was not is that our kids are not here anymore. I also did some uh, research on the numbers that you've already seen from the health department. I keep up with those every quarter. Um, from 2019, 
the whole, uh, it started off with 460, I don't want to touch my thing here. Um, but from 2019 to 2020, it increased 151 deaths. Um, and the percentage of fentanyl related deaths from 19, nine, uh, 2019 to 2020 um, went from 80%, uh, from 60% to 80%, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. And then Again, from 2020 to 2021, it increased by 93 deaths, and the percentage of fentanyl-related deaths went from 80 to 74 percent. So in that case, the fentanyl deaths um, went down a little. Um, the first quarter uh, for Nashville Health Department, and like Sergeant Hot said, we're just talking about Nashville, Davidson County. This is not all of Tennessee. Um, they don't have their new report out for the second quarter yet, but they did give me the numbers. So the trend is definitely going upwards. Um, so for the second quarter, 77.2%, which made up about 113 deaths, were due to illicit fentanyl. <clears throat> So the second important point that we're trying to make is the illicit fentanyl epidemic does not just affect people with a substance use disorder. A great portion of the population that are killed through illicit fentanyl poisoning are young people that are not addicts, that are depressed or stressed, and that trust a friend that gives them a fake pill, like they had mentioned before, Adderall, Percocet, Xanax, to make them feel better for a little bit, but the problem is the friend that might have given him that pill might not even know what's really in it and what they're giving out to people. And that's why one of my greatest missions is to reach out to parents in any way I can that need to be made aware of the dangers of illicit fentanyl poisoning, even if they believe their child would never do drugs. I have a news flash. kids don't always share their fears and feelings with their parents. And I know way too many parents that I'm now connected with, especially on Facebook. There's several groups like ours. Some of them have over 10,000 um, likes on their Facebook pages and they are all parents that have lost a child or a loved one that thought exactly the same thing. So parents really need to be aware of what is going on. Um, I was trying to reach out to the schools to help me with my mission to use the school's resources to reach out to the parents because I figured now they should have email lists of all the parents. I can help them make flyers with the dangers of fentanyl that they could email to the parents once a week so they can see what's going on because it's surprising to me, but I deal with this every day, there's still a lot of parents and people out there that don't even know this exists and it just shocks me, but I guess I shouldn't be surprised because I wouldn't know anything about it. I never heard of this before this happened to Romello, so I have to remind myself of that as well. Um, so I could help them, you know, with a newsletter every week, but I have not really had a chance or an opportunity for any school to work with me. So if anybody here, or if you know anybody that could help me maybe get a meeting with the school board, I'm thinking maybe I need to go through the school board instead of trying to reach principals because then they keep putting me off to somebody else and I never really get anywhere. So it's very frustrating, but I'm not going to give up. I can't. Um, they could also put the same newsletters on their Facebook, on their other social media, um, or they could let people know about a newsletter that I started on our website that if you go to our website, you can sign up where I share um, news reports about fentanyl related things with police busts in every state, not just Tennessee, so people can see that this is a nationwide problem and not just here. So they can go on our website and sign up for that if they like to get that information every week. Um, my fourth point is I've been wanting for, I had actually spoken to Commissioner Marie Williams earlier this year because I thought with 
to Tennessee Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services Department. They should be part of the health department, looking out for the best interest of their, of their communities to do um, billboards that people can see when they drive down the street, you know, down the interstate, all over the um, state and every county. Um, she referred me to the drug coalitions in every county because the state gives them grants to do certain things. So there's about 90 something of them out there. I've only sent emails to about 50 of them. Some of them I couldn't find any contact information. The ones that I did get in contact with is about 24 of them now. I ask them, what do you do? And they say, well, yeah, you know, we bring awareness and but wherever you see, if I look on their social media, especially on Facebook, they talk about everything but fentanyl. They talk about vaping, they talk about tobacco, everything, but I've never seen anything about fentanyl on there. So I'm trying to push a little harder to try to get them to post things about what I feel really needs to be posted because the fentanyl is what kills you in two minutes. Yes, the vaping has probably a long-term effect, but it's not as critical as the fentanyl is. So that's an ongoing effort uh, on my part. Um, and the fifth point is also in, a, in addition to the billboards, the state of Tennessee should do a public service announcement on TV and warn all Tennessee communities of the dangers of illicit fentanyl poisoning. Um, so far, I've not found a person or agency that wants to pay for PSA or organize the steps it takes to produce one. This doesn't seem to be a sense of urgency to get a PSA on TV in Tennessee, but in reality, it should have been done by the federal government within at least the last two years, but they don't seem to have a sense of urgency either. But the sad truth is unless it affects someone personally by losing a child or a loved one, their sense of urgency is just not where it needs to be. And I'm trying to avoid anybody else getting to this point where they get personally affected. But unfortunately, I guess the world we live in, it has to happen to some people for them to realize that this really exists. I actually reached out to Blackbird Media in Nashville to put up um, billboards. They told me they would do two weeks for free. All I needed to do is create them. This is one of them. Uh, they was on Murfreesboro Road and Bell Road. Uh, it was back in February. They did that for two weeks. It was one of those electronic ones, so it would switch around. So it wasn't a static one where people would see it all the time. But I had to grab that because it was for free and I, nobody else would help me putting them up. So I found them and they were wonderful to work with. Um, that's another one. Uh, there was at the Harding Place at Sam's Club uh, in one direction. And I know that my wording on the billboards would be different or is different from what the state would put on it because I can call it what it is. I'm trying to tell everybody to change the terminology to poisoning because people, when they hear overdoses, like on a news report, and they're not, they don't have anybody in their family that's affected by any kind of drugs of any kind or they never use drugs, they hear the word overdose and they're their brain turns off because they think, well, this is just an addict problem. I, you know, I have other things to do. But when they hear the word poisoning, which is what it is, then maybe we can get their attention. And so I can call it what it is when I put it on a billboard. And I would hope that maybe if I can get the state's help, that they would also be willing to change the, the wording, not to confuse people because there is a huge difference between an overdose and a poisoning. Uh, there was another one that was on my drive in Gallatin Road. Um, you know, I put the pictures on there for those fake pills to let people know that they look just like the prescription pills you get from a doctor. You know, it's rush, Russian roulette that kids play and the kids that we mainly try to get um, their parents' attention is between 15 and 25. Um, so that's kind of our age group. But of course, you know, anybody else that we can 
find that um, we need to get the attention to, it doesn't matter what their age is. Um, this one was the biggest one that they have down on 17th Avenue in West End. Uh, it's a 36 by 38 foot. It was huge. They only did that one for a week, but again, it was free and I grabbed it. Um, we have some future projects, um, more in-person events in Nashville. The next one is going to be August 21st. That's different from August 31st. August 31st is um, overdose prevention day, but this August 21st is the first national fentanyl awareness and prevention day um, that was uh, actually created by a friend of mine in Colorado. She's also a mom that lost her daughter. She got um, the proclamation and everything for it, uh, got it trademarked, so it is an official thing. Um, so I'm trying to find right now a location in Nashville where there's good through traffic, where somebody would let me set up some tables and attend, um, you know, to have people come by and give out flyers, have the ropes there, give out Narcan, um, and have some other organizations uh, there as well um, for treatment, which is, we don't, we don't address the treatment, but they do, so we invite each other to each other's events to just, you know, get all of the um, information out there. Um, I recently connected with um, Cumberland University, so I'm trying to also reach out to colleges. Of course, there's a lot of colleges in Tennessee. But um, I started off with Cumberland University in Lebanon, and they, <clears throat> they are gonna, they wanna work with me or with us as far as the organization goes, so I'm looking forward to what that is going to look like. I did find out about the Opioid Abatement Council a few months ago, and um, I want to be able to be at a, a meeting at this, at this council and to make sure that they also give some of this opioid settlement money to awareness campaigns not just treatment and recovery, even though I know this is very important, but it needs to be addressed not just for the opioid um, settlement money, opioid crisis, but also for the fentanyl crisis because they kind of sort of go hand in hand and this fentanyl now is more prevalent than the opioid crisis is anymore. So I'm gonna try to get my foot in the door with them and um, Hopefully they will let me talk to them and hopefully they will also help me maybe pay for some PSAs and for some billboards. Um, I would love to connect with all of the council members. Um, I was hoping more of you would be here today, but that's okay. I know they can see it on TV and I would love to meet with you either on a Zoom or on a phone call and see how we can work together how I can help you get the message out to your district in any shape or form that works for you. Um, obviously time is of the essence because there is so many people that die from this every day. So the sooner we can get together, the better that will be. And I would love to talk to you. Um, also churches, they have a lot of members. I was thinking maybe they would help. Haven't really been that successful with that, but we just kind of started, so we'll just see where that leads. But I'm just thinking, you know, congregations, they have a lot of people that can get the message out in a bigger fashion on a Sunday. You know, it doesn't have to be brought up every Sunday, but maybe for, the, for a month or so. Um, we're trying to get more connections with national media to do stories about the illicit fentanyl crisis. We were blessed with being part of a new ABC News Live story that uh, partially featured Romello's story. Um, I did that in January and then it started, they put it on Hulu as a one hour episode that you can see, it's called Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis. And um, if you're familiar with Bob Woodruff from ABC News, he's a, um, a war um, correspondent back in the Iraq war. And he's actually the one that interviewed me for this and that did this whole series. So it was very um, exciting to be invited to that. Um, I 
also reached out to the NAACP here in Nashville. Um, we're kind of at a standstill right now, but I'm hoping that they will come back and help us try to find ways that we can get out the message. I told you about the National PTA, that they don't support us. Um, I also thought the American Academy of Pediatrics um, would be a good big organization for them to create pamphlets for the pediatric um, or for the pediatricians to give out to parents when they bring their kids in. Um, in that age group for sure. So I haven't quite gotten anywhere with that yet. And then also very important, I want to find a way to include the Hispanic community in this because they are affected just as much as everybody else. And you know, everything is in English and I've, I've made contact with uh, one guy that um, does flyers with the dangers in Spanish. So I'm very excited about that. So, there's my Romello. There is for the National Fentanyl Awareness Day, my friend in Colorado uh, that started that. She made all these flyers. Um, and fentanyl is the leading killer for ages 18 to 45. Um, Romello was 22. I know Megan Barry's Max was 22. So we are right in the middle of that age wise. Another one of um, the flyers that she had is teenagers and young adults turn to Snapchat, TikTok, and other social media apps to purchase Adderall, Percocet, Xanax, and other pills. These drugs are fake and can be deadly. In 2021, 77% of all teen overdose deaths involve fentanyl. Um, on the right-hand side, this is a emoji drug code that kids can find on social media to find what it is they're looking for. They don't have to use the word of the drug that they want. All they have to do is put an emoji in there and the drug dealer knows exactly what they want. Plus, they can order this on TikTok, um, on Snapchat. Snapchat is one of the really bad ones where they order the drug, they bring it to the house like a pizza. The kid goes outside, Parents never know about it. Kid goes in its room, takes that counterfeit pill, and the parents find them dead the next morning. I thought this was very representative of how you feel as a parent. This is a statue that is in Switzerland. And this was a quote by a bereaved parent. We may look as if we carry on with our lives as before. We may even have times of joy and happiness. Everything may seem normal, but this emptiness is how we feel all the time. There's just nothing like losing a child. And I just do not want anybody else to go through that. This is a DEA in the DEA Museum in Arlington, Virginia, they started an exhibit on fentanyl. And these are pictures of kids that parents submitted, parents like me, Romello is in there, that has its own place in that museum right now that they started. Romello is right there. Um, it's a whole wall. That's just part of the wall. That's a pill press right there. That's how they make those pills um, or the type of, of press that they can use. And this is another organization, their son Logan died. Fentanyl warning, fake pills are everywhere. Teach your children, you cannot trust any pill you get online on social media or from a friend, period. Never say, not my child. This is not something I made. This is something another parent made. And there is, I can give you hundreds of parents' names that do that kind of stuff every single day. Just do keep other parents from having to go through this. This is a parent, they did their, they paid for their own billboard with several of these pictures of these kids that we all share when we try to make um, visual examples of what it looks like with all our kids on there. So they pay for, I know a mom in Las Vegas, she put up $36,000 of her own money to put up billboards in Las Vegas, in the Las Vegas area to bring awareness to fentanyl after her son Gio died. This is another collage that somebody else put together. There is 
this type right there, there is 25 pages and there's 60 kids or people's faces on each collage. So I think I came up with whatever that is, 60 times 25. Um, and this is just a small amount of kids and other people that, that have died over the last two, three years. So my question to you is what will you do to help us spread awareness and help save lives in your district? And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jacobs. We have time for maybe one or two questions if anyone has a question for Ms. Jacobs. I really appreciate your passion about sharing your son's story and for traveling here uh, to be with us today and for all the resources that you shared with the community. And we've got opportunities, of course, to spread this information within our districts and newsletters and social media posts and everything. So thank you very much for being here and your time today. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. All right, we're gonna to transition to our next parent. Who also happens to be our former mayor, Megan Berry. I had the opportunity to hear um, Megan's story um, at a recent presentation and it was very powerful and I thought it provides some very simple things that all of us can do uh, to help save lives in our community. Um, and so I appreciate her taking the time to come and share with us today. Uh, Council member, thank you so much for inviting me to be in this uh, very august body of, of folks who have shown up today, who obviously care deeply about this issue. I am looking to the back of the gallery where I see the faces of the family members. And I know that many of you brought pictures of your children. Would you be so kind as to stand up and to show us those pictures, please? And I think there were some in the front too that were that were there as well. And and I love that you have on hope as well because there is hope. But thank you for sharing your children with us today and letting us see their faces. We as family members, I think, are oftentimes asked to say their names, um, and by saying their name, we remember them. So I say my son's name today, Max, and I'm glad that you're here to share your children with us. Thank you. A little bit about me. Let's see if I can get this to work. So, mm, Rosie? <laughs> I've got this one to go forward. Is, am I, is that that? Yeah. Okay, so let's try that. Okay, there we go. Nope. Thank you for your patience. We'll get this. Nope. I can just do it with that. No, it still isn't showing it. Um, you want to hit resume slideshow? You think that'll do it? or just start it again. Okay. There we go. That's I had, and that's the one I want right yes. there. Yes. yes. Can I just hit this? Yes. Yes. Oh my goodness. This is awesome. Thank you so much, Rosie. So a little bit about me. Uh, I had the opportunity to serve in this council as well as the mayor of this city and I lost a child uh, to an overdose death back in 2017. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, um, but I wanna talk a lot about everything else that's going on. We've heard from some incredible experts today on numbers. 
I think what we need to continue though to say loudly is that drug overdoses are a national crisis. Drug overdoses in Nashville are also at a crisis point. What do the numbers tell us nationally? I can tell you that if we look at the nationally, we've had over 100,000 drug overdose deaths in the US, and those numbers always lag. Those overdose deaths, as we've just eloquently heard, are primarily fentanyl, and that's what's happening. The causes of death nationally, if we just look at those numbers, COVID back in 2020 was 352,000 people. Drug overdoses were over 100,000. If you were homeless, 17,000 to 40,000 estimated people died on the streets. Suicide, 45,000. Gun violence, 45,000. Breast cancer, 42,000. Car accidents, 38,000. Murders, 21,000. And which one of these do we treat like a national crisis and which ones do we not? We do not treat drug overdoses at the moment like a national crisis. What do the numbers tell us in Davidson County? We've heard from experts in Davidson County in those statistics from the Metro Health Department, we've heard 712 people died from a suspected overdose back in 2021. Previously, the deadliest record on year, year on record was 2020 with a 14% increase. Fentanyl was present in 74% of those toxicology reports. And year to date, we are suspect that we've had 367 people who have died this year so far of a suspected overdose. The suspected drug overdoses in Davidson County that require an actual response, these are people who um, possibly overdose but don't die, but that our um, Nashville Fire Department and EMS have to respond to. 2022, about 104 incidents per week. Since the beginning of this year, 3,039 people have had a response by um, our, our great EMTs. Last week in Nashville alone, there were 124 suspected drug overdoses requiring a response. That's 18 incidents a day. There are breakdowns by zip codes where I know you all as council members can ask to see as part of your district. Uh, EMS responds um, to zip codes and if we look at the one that includes downtown and our tourist areas, uh, to date from January to July, we're at 731 suspected overdoses with 196 where Naxalon was given. Richard Florida, who is a urbanist, helped brand Nashville in lots of different ways when I was uh, uh, mayor, when I was on council through his work that he called the creative class. Um, he recognized Nashville as the it city. Well, he has a new phrase. It's called blotto tourism. Now party buses may contribute to branding Nashville as the next blotto tourism destination, but I continue to say that overdoses are gonna do it a whole lot sooner. So how did we get here? All you have to do is look at the news, look at pharma companies, look at the Sacklers, and you can look and look and see all of that. But the thing that's important to us right now is that money that was just given to communities. Tennessee is gonna get over $600 million over 18 years, and Davidson County is gonna receive 23 million over 18 years. Well, what does that really equate to? Well, it equates to about 1.2 million a year, and at $27,000 for an average 30-day stay in an inpatient facility, that means we're gonna be able to treat about 45 people a year. So don't think that that money's gonna go very far. We have to be thoughtful about how we're allocating those resources and we need to seek out more. So what are the costs if we do nothing besides the tragic loss of so many children? If that doesn't get you, maybe the, to the total cost should. It cost us $700 billion annually for healthcare cost, criminal justice cost, costs associated with lost productivity. We're spending a whole lot of money to just give it Band-Aids and we need a much more comprehensive approach because we're not gonna arrest our way out of this. So how do we start to get our arms around this very complex issue? 
Metro Council has a huge role, and so does the mayor's office. Two places that can lead from Nashville. We have the Metro Council's Public Health and Safety Committee where we are today that has decided to take this on by having these meetings, by drawing attention to this, which I commend the council and Councilman Evans for doing exactly that. We can learn from best practices from other cities who are leading the way. That means having comprehensive strategic plans that include efforts that are brokered between the key stakeholders. We've heard a lot about it, the stakeholders. They all need to work together and they need to have metrics and goals. And there are lots of places to go for best practices. If you're sitting in this body, you might very well be a member of the National League of Cities. The National League of Cities has published a fairly comprehensive look at what other cities are doing to address this. You can also go down the road to Knoxville. Knoxville created the All for Knox strategic plan that has exactly what you need as a roadmap. In November of 2021, the Bloomberg Philanthropies announced a $120 million investment. As a city, we should be going after those dollars. And let me tell you why. Let me bring it home. Like many of you, you have families that gather at Christmas or Thanksgiving or holidays that are special. My family does too. And when we gather, we oftentimes play games. This past November, at Thanksgiving, we gathered, and this was the game that somebody had brought. It was called Five Second Rule. And basically what you do is you grab a card, looks something like this, and it says, name three things you'd like to set on fire. And you have five seconds to, to name those things. As we were playing this game, the next card that my husband drew was this one. Name three people who have overdosed. This was a game. But it was also a realization that so many of us know many people who have died of overdose deaths. And they are our mothers and our daughters and our sisters and our brothers, our sons, our husbands, our nephews, our nieces, our cousins, our friends, and our loved ones. And we have seen some of their faces today in the back. We've seen some of their faces here. Tanya shared some faces as well. And let me share with you one more face, and that would be the face of my son, Max Berry. Max was born December 9th, 1994, and he died July 29th, 2017. That's next weekend. It will be five years since my husband and I have lived on this earth without our beautiful boy. Many of you know our story, and for those of you who don't, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background. When Max died in 2017, that year, 70,000 other families lost someone to an overdose. And since then, close to 340 more thousand families have lost someone to an overdose. And that has come at the expense of so much grief and sadness. And I wanna tell you my child's story. And I wanna do this not because I wanna break your heart, and trust me, I'm broken enough for all of us. I'm sad, but I wanna tell you Max's story because I wanna tell you what might have been. And I also wanna give you hope. Hope that the stories for your loved ones and your friends or for you can end differently. It has to start with treating this like the disease it is. Substance use disorder is a disease and in order to do that, we have to peel away the shame and the guilt. So Max's substance use disorder started in college. He had a type A mom uh, who was busting his chops about getting an internship, about getting a job, and he found a prescriber, someone who would give him Xanax. I assume that that was a medical professional, at least potentially in the beginning, but I don't know for sure. I just know that when we spoke to Max, we knew our child was in trouble. We could hear it in his voice. We got him home, 
so we could figure out exactly what was going on and what we were dealing with. And I still remember taking him directly to the ER because I didn't really have any idea what was wrong. And that's where I got to see firsthand the shame and the guilt rear its head for this disease. Max was immediately taken back uh, into the room at the ER, and because he was 21, he refused to sign any forms that would have allowed me to come into the room and talk to the doctor. Max's shame and guilt were the most dangerous things in that room that night. I waited outside, and when the doctor finally came out, he told me he couldn't tell me anything because Max wouldn't let him. My son was ashamed. The doctor told me to go home to figure out a plan, and then whatever we were dealing with was gonna clear his system, and I needed to come back at six o'clock the next morning and pick him up. The doctor didn't tell me what we were dealing with. He didn't tell me how to deal with it. Um, there were no instructions about how to navigate substance use disorder. I assumed though that whatever was wrong with Max was drug related, so I went home and I got on my computer and I started searching. I wanna just put this in perspective for you because at that time, I was the mayor of this great city and I certainly had resources at my disposal to call people to ask for help, people to ask questions of. And you know what? I didn't call anyone. I didn't call my mom. I didn't call my sisters. I didn't call a friend. I didn't call Max's pediatrician. Why? Because I was ashamed. I was ashamed that my son might be a drug addict. Now, I wanna play this whole scene out differently for you in a different way. Let's just say that when we spoke to Max and we noticed that there was something wrong in his voice, that we thought that there was something medically wrong with him and we got him home and we got him into the ER and the doctor said to Max, hey, you have a disease and it's treatable. And we need to work out a treatment plan. Uh, I need you to sign this form so I can talk to your mom about what we're gonna do next. And you know what? I absolutely believe that my son would have said, where's the form? Where do I sign? Get my mom in here so we can figure out what I have to do next. And then my outreach that night wouldn't have been to Google, it would have been to my mom and my sisters and my community and my family and said, how do we manage this? How do we figure out the resources that we're gonna need? How are we gonna find the best doctors? How are we gonna help Max learn to manage this chronic illness that he has for the rest of his life? If we had treated this like a disease instead of a moral failure, I believe Max would still be here today. Now Max did go to a rehab program and then he went back and he finished his senior year in college. And in our minds, Max was cured. We didn't mention it much to family and friends and we didn't want the stigma of Max being a drug addict to follow him. We believed that we had checked the box, that Max didn't have to worry about this anymore, so we didn't have to worry about it anymore. But just to be sure, my husband Bruce talked to Max every day to make sure he didn't hear anything in his voice and we never heard it. If only we had known, if only we had known that our shame and guilt was preventing us from a deeper understanding of what was gonna happen. If only someone had told us how critical that first year anniversary was. <sighs> if only we had thought of this as a disease. We didn't. We didn't know how vulnerable Max was um, that first anniversary because we thought we'd beaten this. So on Saturday, July 29th, 2017, close to that one year anniversary of Max getting out of rehab, he died of an overdose in Colorado. And this is what I know about his evening. He was hanging out with friends on his a back deck of a suburban house that somebody was house sitting. His friends were hungry. They wanted to go get something to eat. 
And Max just tells him, go on without us, without me. I'm gonna just stay back here and just bring me back some food. When I think about that evening, I imagine him stretching out on his chair, taking a drag on his cigarette, tipping his chair back and looking up at the sky. And I imagine him thinking about his dog, Hank, and me and his dad, closing his eyes and being grateful for that moment. Perhaps the drugs are kicking in, the lethal combination of Xanax, methadone, hydromorphone, and cocaine. Perhaps he knows something is wrong and he thinks of the one person who can help him and he calls me. And my phone is on silent that night and I miss his call. His friends are gone 40 minutes, but by the time they get back, Max is having a seizure. He's overdosing. But these are 20-something-year-old boys, and they do not know what to do. So they throw some water on him and hope it helps. Finally, one of them has the wherewithal to pick up the phone and call 911, and the paramedics are there quickly. They give him two doses of Narcan, but it doesn't help. He dies on the back deck. He is dead by 10.30. I noticed that I've missed his call, and so I text him back, and I say, I missed a call from you. Do you need me to call you back? No response. He is dying as I am texting him. I understand that there is a 911 tape of his last few minutes. Some of the local Nashville TV stations obtained a copy, and they played it. Strangers across Nashville heard my son gasp for air and his friends scream, but I could never listen. Max had a disease. He had substance use disorder, and he had that disease until the day he died. Now comes the hope part. We're here talking about it. We are in this council chambers. You are here listening, and there is light. We can peel away this shame and this guilt together. The only reason Max continues to exist is because I get a chance to talk about him. I am so grateful that I am here today to talk about Max and for remembering him and getting to say his name. At Max's memorial service, my husband said that the counterweight to grief is community. The counterweight to recognize and fighting this disease is community. We can't do it alone, and you are all part of it. So thank you for being the counterweight. I'm very grateful. Thank you so much for being here today. I greatly appreciate your time and, and coming to the chambers to share your message with all of us. One thing I wanted to, um, first of all, we can take a couple of questions if anybody, uh, we have a couple council members here, if any of you have questions that you would like to ask Mayor Berry. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, one thing I will say is kind of talking about the opportunities that we have as a council body as we are going to be um, having a couple of public uh, committee sponsored sessions uh, with ROPES, which is the Regional Overdose Prevention Specialists. I've got three dates I'm gonna read as Mary Lyndon Salter makes her way towards the front. Um, the very first session that we will have is on August the 11th, thank you, um, which is a Thursday from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. at the Hermitage Library. Um, I will be at that session. I will be at all these sessions. Uh, the next session that we'll be having uh, that's sponsored by the committee is Saturday, August the 13th um, at the Antioch Library at the Southeast Community Center uh, from 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. Um, the last session that we currently have scheduled is for Saturday, August the 20th, um, located in Madison from 11.30 in the morning to 12.30 p.m. We'll hear from the Regional Overdose Response Specialist Team. Um, and this is really important because we do have to educate ourselves and, and learn a lot more about what's happening in our communities. And these three uh, parts of town were selected because they're part of the highest um, hotspot areas in our county. So we're 
are starting there first. So just to all have this published on the Nashville.gov website and um, also be distributing to council members as well. So thanks again, uh, Megan Berry, for sharing your story. And then um, our last speaker is Mary Lyndon Salter um, from the Tennessee Association of Alcohol, Drug, and Other Addiction Services. Uh, Mary Lyndon Salter spoke to us in March. Um, and one of the things that she highlighted was some upcoming legislation um, that at that point was in progress with the state of Tennessee legislature. And so she's here today to share some information about where that legislation landed, what does it mean for Davidson County. And so with that, I will turn it over to Mary Lyndon Salter. Thank you. Thank you. Am I, am I live? Yeah, I think you're on. You may need to pull okay. your microphone down. Okay. There we go. Better. So I, I have a one-page handout that I did uh, bring some copies of, and I'll try to put some in the rear as well when, um, when I leave. But um, I'm going to follow up on several pieces of legislation that I talked about in March. Um, the first bill... Um, is uh, an naloxone access bill that actually uh, TADA sponsored this session. Um, it was intended to change how um, people could access uh, naloxone through pharmacies and other prescribers. Um, the previous legislation allowed for pharmacies to dispense it if they chose to enter into a pharmacy practice agreement. Um, this legislation uh, that passed and was effective July 1st changed that strategy so now um, you can basically go to a ph um, any pharmacy and that pharmacy doesn't have to be a participating pharmacy in order to dispense you naloxone. You can purchase it wholesale. You can distribute as much as you want. You don't need to enter into any kind of a, a training uh, relationship with that person that you're giving it to. So a lot of community programs, schools, um, health departments, everybody now can actually purchase, distribute it, and do so freely without any inhibitions. So that's one of the best things that we've been able to do um, in, the in the legislature this year, I think. Um, the second uh, piece of legislation I want to talk about uh, was one that legalized um, fentanyl, uh, the possession of fentanyl test strips. Um, uh, previously, those were considered drug paraphernalia. They are now legal to uh, obtain and use and distribute, uh, with one exception, and that is that if you are in possession of them and you're being charged um, as a distributor or a seller of uh, narcotics, then you can also be charged with possession of those. But this is a, a life-saving measure, actually, because using fentanyl test strips allows people to know what is in what they're taking. And as long as they are using those test strips and uh, the fentanyl is um, a naturally occurring product, they will be able to know and make a choice about whether they want to take it or perhaps engage uh, a buddy or some other system to make sure that they're safe as they continue to use that product. I do want to point out, however, it does not test for fentanyl analogs. Those analogs change so frequently that the uh, molecule um, of them changes in such a way that the fentanyl test strip literally can't keep up. But um, for, na uh, for testing a natural product, they um, will work just fine. Um, I also want to point out something else. Um, there's a lot of um, mythology and rumors on the internet about touching fentanyl and overdosing. Um, that is not accurate. Um, you cannot touch fentanyl and, and, and overdose. It has to enter your bloodstream. It has to come in through some mechanism in order for you to overdose. So you can actually touch fentanyl, test it, mix it in water to use the test strip. You can um, use it to test your as the test strips were originally uh, manufactured, but you cannot overdose by touching fentanyl. I would also encourage people, if you're going to use fentanyl, fentanyl test strips, to uh, go out and look on YouTube even. There's uh, lots of videos about how to use them, how to use them accurately, how to make sure that what you're testing is appropriate. Um, we're going to have a fentanyl test strip um, how-to training on Overdose Awareness Day, August 31st this year. So if you go to Tadis's website, tadis.org, you can sign up for that training. It's free, and we'll show you how to use them. 
the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services is, has been distributing naloxone kits or overdose survival kits for several years. Um, as of this year, they're gonna put fentanyl test strips in those overdose survival kits. And uh, TADIS is actually the entity that is contracted to distribute those kits around the state. We ordered our first batch of test strips and those will be, begin to be distributed in the next few weeks. The third bill I wanna to talk to you about um, has to do with opioid prescriptions. This was, co was called the opio uh, co uh, prescribing bill. This uh, bill actually requires healthcare providers to offer a prescription of naloxone when they um, prescribe uh, an opioid um, with certain um, uh, uh, caveats, and that is if you're getting opioids because you're in a nursing home or some kind of palliative care that doesn't need to be offered. But for a general prescription, you might get at a, uh, a dentist or because you've, you know, from the ER, you're gonna have to be offered naloxone. So hopefully people will be educated about what it is and be able to take it home based on that um, offer. The next bill I wanna talk about is uh, pill presses and as uh, have been made um, drug paraphernalia under this piece of legislation. Um, uh, previously, um, they were just considered a, a tr trade item, if you will. Um, people who uh, are part of a compounding pharmacy, for example, can still possess them legally, but um, they are considered drug paraphernalia unless you have a business um, uh, use for that pill press. And I realized too late that I did not put the effective date on this handout. It is, uh, that law was effective July 1st, 2022 as well. The last bill um, was something that a, a couple of our presenters have already uh, talked about. Uh, the State Opioid Abatement Council was created by the Tennessee General Assembly uh, in 2021, and it met for the first time July 8th, um, just this month. Um, it is a statewide council of members that were appointed by the governor, um, the um, Speaker of the House, the Lieutenant Governor, and two other trade associations. Um, that council will make decisions about how the state um, distributes um, its share of the naloxone settlement. Um, Davidson County will get its own share and be able to determine how it wants to spend those dollars. But I do uh, agree with the previous participants that uh, attending those council meetings and making sure you know how your community is spending those dollars is really critical to be able to make sure that those decisions are well informed. I also wanna talk about um, a comment that Ms. Myers made, our first presenter, about the Good Samaritan Law in Tennessee. Um, it does currently say that um, if you overdose, um, you get a one-time get out of jail free card and uh, you won't be prosecuted for um, having narcotics or drug paraphernalia. But uh, that law only gives you a one-time um, uh, kind of uh, uh, limitation. Um, there is a a measure that's coming out of the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse uh, Policy and Planning Council um, to change the law so that there are no limitations. That package has gone to the governor and we hope that the governor will put it in his legislative packet for this year. If for any reason he doesn't, there is a group of advocacy um, organizations such as TADIS who are gonna take it up in the legislature next year. So we hope that that will be changed in the coming uh, session. I also wanna point out that um, although the sergeant talked about um, a, a a, and a line where you can call to get um, treatment information. There is also a statewide um, drug and alcohol treatment information helpline called the Tennessee Red Line. And I didn't uh, bring anything with it on it because I wasn't expecting to talk about it. But um, that number is, again, a statewide toll-free anonymous um, referral line where you can get referrals for treatment um, if you're indigent, uninsured, or underinsured. And that number is 800 889-9789. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. 
Thank you. Um, I guess one of the things I wanted, well, first of all, I wanted to mention that uh, the entity that was one of the biggest shares of misinformation about fentanyl is no longer in the room. So somebody on the internet, please cut out um, Ms. Salter's uh, information and make sure it's shared with um, that particular news organization. But uh, which of these laws do you feel like, um, based on your experience, may have the, the most significant impact on Davidson County? Well, I think the ability to share naloxone more freely is, is going to be a game changer. Previously, the regional overdose prevention specialists, for example, were able to hand out naloxone, but only to entities that they trained firsthand, and it was like one kit for every person trained. You had to go through that training in order to get the free kit. Um, now it's completely opened up. So, um, like I said, schools, um, the Kiwanis Club, the jail, anybody can order it, distribute it, and give it out for free. Um, it has also opened up a lot of grant opportunities because things like um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, for example, was giving free naloxone to states where it could be freely distributed. Tennessee was not eligible because we didn't have a law that allowed for that distribution. So now a lot of those grant funded programs will be something that we can bring to Tennessee. That's, that's excellent. Um, uh, any of our council members in the room have any question? I'm not seeing Councilwoman Hauser. Hang on just a second. I just want to make sure that I heard you correctly. So you could get the, you do not have to pay for the kids. You can get a free naloxone kit currently from the Regional Overdose Prevention Specialists. And um, TADIS actually distributes information about how to order naloxone if you're a nonprofit. Currently, we, there's a, pro a program from the manufacturer that allows for a two dose kit to be purchased for, I think it's $43.99. So it's well under what market price is at a current pharmacy. And Councilwoman Hauser, when I was mentioning those sessions in Hermitage, Antioch, and Madison, those are the, the regional overdose prevention specialists are coming to those communities. I'm happy to connect you with our contacts over there um, if you want to talk to them further about coming to Bellevue. All right. All right, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for this information and your advocacy on these uh, laws passing. I know it's a lot of work uh, for your organization and many others, and the support, of course, of the state is very important in this fight. Um, I know we went over time. I really appreciate everybody's patience. Thank you so much again to the family members who um, came today uh, to share uh, the images of your uh, children and family um, who have been lost to this um, this terrible disease and also the poisoning that we're experiencing in our city. Um, I'll be sending some follow-up information to our committee and to the next chair, uh, whomever that is, uh, at the end of August. Uh, we will be switching committee chairs, but I hopefully will be staying on the committee so we can continue to have conversations like this. Appreciate our speakers, um, Madeline Myers, uh, Sergeant Hotz, Tanya Jacobs, Megan Berry, and Mary Lynn and Salter for being here. And thank you for the support, and I appreciate your time and have a wonderful rest of your day and with that we're adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.